in the most recent controversy with the likes of Kanye West and Kyrie Irving. The argument of who the true Jews are has hit much of the mainstream. In fact, sports commentator Jason Whitlock, while commenting on the controversy, quoted from Revelation 2.9 in asking whether or not the Bible will be banned as well, believing that that scripture might state that the Jews who currently say they are Jews are not, but are merely a synagogue of Satan. So we want to look as to whether or not Revelation 2 and 3.9 prove that the Jews today are merely imposters. To discuss this very important topic is none other than the president and founder of Good Fight Ministries and pastor of Blessed Hope Chapel in Simi Valley, California, Pastor Joe Schimmel. Chad, this is an important topic. If you take a scripture out of its context, it becomes a pretext for proof texting a position. Uh, that scripture in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan, is a passage that is dealing with Jews that are persecuting that particular church. But if you isolate that from the whole picture, not only in Revelation, which mentions, by the way, 144,000 Jews sealed from all, each of the 12 tribes by God to protect them during the tribulation period. And it also mentions Jews in, in Israel a number of times in the book of Revelation. Uh, God's not anti-Semitic. God chose Abraham, a Jew, and us Gentiles are grateful that he chose the Jews because through the Jews, he brought the gospel to Gentile believers. Unfortunately, when you look at the a greater context, which is being missed. Unfortunately for them, uh, they end up using it as an anti-Semitic trope, saying, hey, look, God's against those who are are claimed to be Jews but aren't really following the Lord, and what have you. But God has patience, and we see the bigger picture, which is ironic because the book of Revelation also shows the hope of Jews in the Messiah, Jesus, the Lamb of God. Yes, and one of the things that is really disheartening when you see this is that, one, this is a cult. The Black Hebrew Israelites, they call themselves just Israelites, and we'll talk about what that means in We've a little bit. We've done some exposés on them. Yep. We, we have, and they are a cult. They're an identity cult. Now, there are plenty of just historical background, and we could go into that about how there are absolutely black Jews. We actually know that, or black Israelites, so to speak, in Ethiopia, Ethiopia, and so forth. And, you know, Solomon did have multiple wives from a lot Amen. of different places. And so there is some truth in that portion of it. But if you actually get down to what BHI churches and One West churches, so to speak, they wouldn't even call themselves a church, but these groups teach, not only are they dangerous, a lot of times they're polygynist. That's not polygamy. They only believe that a man can have multiple wives and so mm -hmm. forth. That makes the argumentation that Jesus used very interesting in Matthew chapter 22 when he debated the Sadducees specifically regarding there being a resurrection, there being an afterlife, when they tried to give him a reductio ad absurdum argumentation to reduce his answer to absurdity because Jesus would never affirm polygamy. So therefore, when a woman marries uh, multiple men, who is she married to? The, you know, one brother dies and so forth. And Jesus says, we aren't given uh, to marriage. We're like angels in heaven. And he answers the argument against them because they did not know the scriptures nor the power of God. And Amen. I would say the same thing with this identity cult as well. There was a British identity cult. This isn't the first yeah, time. where white people were claimed to be the Jews. Yeah. Exactly. And it's not the first time that these scriptures have been used in this capacity to say, oh, well, and what it really does is the same thing that's done in the book of Deuteronomy with those who say, hey, I can figure it out. This is how we can look and find our lineage. We see the curse happening. And Deuteronomy, I believe it's uh, 2668, where it says that they'll be taken on ships and it says they'll be brought back to Egypt. But they apply that. Well, Egypt's kind of like America, so they'll be brought to Egypt. So the transatlantic slave trade, that they'll come here and they will find no buyers. Now, that's a problem because... Not only did they not go to Egypt and having to spiritualize it in that capacity, yeah. there's a reason you're doing that. Number two, when you get to it and we see there are no buyers, oh, there the plenty reasons, of buyers. <laughs> that's why we can point to how wicked it was that this was going on. Yeah. And we can say because they were wicked buyers Amen. enslaving people. Absolutely. And so it's a misuse um, of the prophecy. And right. It's a misuse and it's a rendering of certain things spiritual that are not and not to be taken in such a manner. But nonetheless, when we see this, and this is what was disheartening to me because I've seen Jason Whitlock recently. Now, in previous times, I remember watching some drop video of him using some foul language and stuff. I was hoping that he's more recently repented. He said some really 
uh, good things. He even called out Mount Walsh, who, by the way, is a Catholic. You guys may really like some of his documentaries, What is a Woman, and so forth, but he is a practicing Catholic, and you can hear it in his argumentation with Joe Rogan recently regarding uh, homosexual marriage. You see the fly in the ointments of these guys who seem really conservative, but then you look and they don't have the answer because it's not a biblical worldview. It has an idea of a biblical worldview, but it's not really a biblical worldview. And Jason Whitlock brought that out and said, hey, why didn't you use the Bible? Why didn't you bring up God in your What is a Woman documentary? And he's like, oh, yeah. well, I got to read Secular Society. So there's been things that Jason Whitlock has brought out that I thought have been really good, which is why when I saw this tweeted during the controversy with Kanye, and this is before Kanye started praising Hitler and getting really, really strange out there, but something we warned about. And Kanye was using this scripture to come against the Jews. 100%. And here is what Jason Whitlock tweeted out. When will the Bible be deplatformed and canceled? This was right after Kanye was taken off of Twitter. Revelation 2.9, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them, which say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now, I've seen a number of brothers and sisters in Christ who have quoted that and even asked Joe on our shows, hey, can you explain Revelation 2.9 and 3.9? I'm not understanding it. Because what it looks like is they're taking this and they say, hey, is this applied to what we're seeing today? So should I apply Revelation 2.9 and 3.9 to Jewish men and women in New York? Hasidic Jews, and so forth. Should I be doing that? Then let's look at Jason Whitlock more recently. Uh, in fact, this is December 5th. He posts a picture. And the wording is what really stuck out to me, and I'll tell you why. It says, wonder if the NBA will suspend me. Bunch of Israelites stopped by the studio to chat. Former NFL players, Robert Mathis, Kabir Kabaja Biamila, Daniel Muir, TJ Clemmings, and Pastor Charles Dow of Straightway Truth ministries. Now, all of them are guys who believe in the doctrine of the black Hebrew Israelites. But what struck me there, Joe, was Jason Whitlock's use of the bunch of Israelites, not black Hebrew Israelites, but a bunch of Israelites, because now he's yeah. affirming what they're teaching. So when he questioned what was going on with Kanye based on, because basically with Kanye and Kyrie, Kyrie sharing a video which was Hebrews to Negroes, a documentary. And guys, we have an entire video on that subject that you guys can check out. We'll put a link in the description regarding just that documentary. And what's interesting, and one of the things we point out there is that they quote Hitler in that documentary, trying to claim that Hitler knew who the true Jews were and the true Jews were the black Hebrew Israelites, so to speak. And really that's what he was trying to stop. Really strange stuff. The quote is not found anywhere. It's supposedly a yeah. private conversation uh, with, uh, you know, some sort of uh, you can military. You say Hitler said agenda. anything and then say, oh, it was a private conversation. It's it a private kind of conversation. Documentation of it. No documentation whatsoever. And just show that the entire documentary, first of all, it d denies much of the Holocaust or at least the big numbers yeah. of Jews that died and, and so forth. So so that's why the danger there. Now, we are not talking about deplatforming, shutting people up, not letting them talk, stuff like that. that that's for another conversation of what people want to allow and whatever. But when you are saying, hey, I disagree with you deplatforming Kanye West or something, but then you reply, well, there might be some agreement here with Revelation 2.9. And that's all he's doing is he's proving what Revelation 2.9 is. And I thought, well, maybe he's just saying this is quoted and people could have it out of context. That's what I, I want to give people the benefit of the doubt. So hopefully that's what Jason Whitlock was saying. But then when you have guys on your show, and I haven't watched the show yet, that they were on. He just posted the picture recently on his on his page to show that we were just with them. But the danger of that, Joe, that I see is that it seems like, especially when you're giving credence to, well, they're really the, the Semitic. That's why Kyrie Irving says, I can't be anti-Semitic. I'm Semitic. So even if you take that idea, first of all, it says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 15, if you hate someone, period, if you hate someone, that you're a murderer. Yeah. And, the, and no murderer has eternal, eternal life. life in the and so if you want to try to say, oh, well, they don't, they, they're not anti-Semitic because they're really Semitic and these people have taken from their identity. Well, the problem is you still hate a people group for some reason. Now you may think, oh, well, I'm hating them because they took away all of this, you know, this lineage that I have. And Kanye West said, really, he's the bloodline of Jesus and Margaret Sanger, who there is truth that Margaret Sanger was trying to kill off black babies. You can see that in our documentary the Dark Secrets of Planned Parenthood, it's without a doubt she wanted to kill off black babies. That's true. Is it because the bloodline of Jesus and we need to have some sort of bloodline from Jesus and this he, she was trying to kill it off? That's not true. 
And so when we see those things, it's like, man, what a mixed bag to talk against pornography, to talk against abortion and all this stuff and realize that you're doing it with this in mind as well. And it's really heartbreaking to me to see Jason Whitlock, who I thought, you know, had a lot of good things to say. Ultimately, I haven't seen everything about him, but just some things he said. I think we used uh, one, a portion of it in one of our, on the Super Bowl video and so forth. Some things are really good. And, and so one of the things we want to talk about are these texts because there is beauty in these texts when you understand the context. There, are be- there is beauty in this text when we understand Smyrna and Philadelphia, which is the term is used the same way, Revelation 2.9, Revelation 3.9, easy to remember. It's used the, the same way and for the same reason ultimately. Mm-hmm. And what that reason is, and it's interesting because three, especially when you get three, seven and three, eight, when you have the key of David that Jesus has, and he's the one that closed doors that can't be opened. He's the one who opens doors that can't be shut. And what was happening to Smyrna and what was happening to Philadelphia at that time? Just a small background I want to try to give before we get into some other texts, Joe. The, The churches there in Smyrna and in Philadelphia at that time these men and women still had some sort of peace. There were clubs allowed by the Romans. They allowed for clubs to take place. So you had Jews that were able to practice their religion. And so they, the Jews were not forced to sacrifice to Caesar as Yahweh. But any new clubs that tried to form, so to speak, like the Christian club, they were saying, no, we're Jewish. We're, we, we're not going to sacrifice to a false god. We are a part of this Jewish club. And they were getting the door shut in their face. And I want you to picture that. Some of these were exactly what Jesus said, that he didn't come to bring peace but a sword. And even inside the household, some of these were people shutting off and knowing that their family members ultimately were not going to were not going to sacrifice to Caesar. They were not going to call him Yahweh. And ultimately, when they were shutting the doors in the synagogue, they were shutting the doors and they were giving them a death sentence. They were going to die. That was it for them, even if they were family members. And this terminology that is being used, this synagogue of Satan, was not something that was used as kind of like an acid acid wash test to figure out who a Jew is, whether or not someone's a Jew. This was used by the people of the Dead Sea Scrolls in their writings where they talk about an ecclesia of Belial or Satan. And it was an of other inter- Jews. Yeah. Of, of other Jews. It yeah. was an inter-Jewish polemic and diatribe. Right. It wasn't something that was, oh, well, here's a real Jew and this one's not. How can we know it? Oh, the color of their skin or whatever it may be. No, what he was saying here specifically is that ultimately they don't know what they're talking about. And this was specifically a diatribe against the people of Smyrna and the people of Philadelphia. And one thing, Joe, I want to point out a couple texts because do does every time we see the word Jew used, is it only used of believers? Because that would be what needs to be affirmed here or only used yeah, of if Jews. All non-believing Jews were of the synagogue of Satan. They could be called Jews, but the text, the scriptures obsolete do call them uh, Jews. And I want to give you guys Jews, just yeah. two, and there's more than this, especially if you go through the book of Acts, but I'm just going to give you Two instances specifically that doesn't just say, well, every Jew who claims to be a Jew who doesn't follow Jesus, which is more replacement theology, and granted, not that black Hebrew Israelism isn't replacement theology, but still, they think that, oh, okay, this means that that person, this is how we depict and understand who a Jew is. Because some people believe that, oh, you're a Jew because you're one inwardly, not one outwardly, and so forth, because now you're saved, so you're part of the commonwealth of Israel, and so forth. And still, that's not what the New Testament teaches. So I, I want to point this out because just two texts should do the trick, hopefully for you, because this is in the New Testament, to show you that in the New Testament, believers talked about non-believers, specifically Paul in both of these instances, talked about non-believers still as Jews without them being a synagogue of Satan and not real Jews. In 1 Corinthians 9, starting at verse 19, it says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. He's trying to win them to what? He's trying to win them to Christ. To the Jews, I become as a Jew so that I might win Jews to those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law to the weak 
I become weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that by all means I might save some. I do all these things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker in it. Obviously, he's trying to win over Jews. But if you don't believe me, I'm just talking about evil deeds of the Jews and so forth. Here's once again, Paul in Romans chapter two, starting at verse nine, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also to the Greek, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Why, Joe? Because there is no partiality with God. Obviously, if the New Testament teaches that there are Jews that are not saved, then I cannot apply Revelation 2.9 and 3.9 as an acid test to see whether or not is this person a Jew or is that person not a Jew, unbelieving or not. Yeah, amen. I think our readers would be well served to understand and what Chad is basically saying there is, and if you look at the, the, the scriptures that teach in the New Testament, the Bible recognizes two different types of Jews. The Bible recognizes those who are Jews according to the flesh. Paul said in Romans chapter 9, 3, he talked about his brethren, his his Jewish brethren, who are his kinsmen, he said, according to the flesh. But he says in Romans chapter 2 that a true Jew is circumcised in the heart and not just a Jew according to the flesh. So there are those who are Jews that are descendants of Abraham physically, and they're still called Jews. And there are also those Jews that are completed Jews, would probably be better than true Jews, because Jews who uh, have descended from Abraham but haven't received their Messiah yet are still true Jews but according to the flesh, whereas those who've received the Messiah, Paul says, they are Jews according to the Spirit, and they are completed Jews. A lot of the Messianic Jews, the Jews that come to Christ, that would call themselves completed Jews. And it's just important to understand the context here. So when we're talking about Jews, we don't say, oh, that person's Jewish, but since they don't know the Lord or they're not in our group, you know, therefore they're not really Jewish, you know, they're the synagogue of the devil and they're not really Jews. That's not what's being said because Paul spoke of those who are Jews according to the flesh. You can say Jews that don't know Jesus, and Paul was one of them for some time, but God loved him, amen? God set his affection on him and saved Paul, just like so many Jews will be saved in the end, and we're gonna read about that. But it's, it's quite important that you understand, I understand that there's Jews according to the flesh who don't know the Messiah yet. We pray that they come to know Jesus. And there are Jews who uh, do know Jesus, are completed in Messiah. So it's also important to understand the context as Chad was saying, doors were being shut to Christians who were Jewish believers, often like John who wrote the book of Revelation, who were being excommunicated. John was on the Isle of Patmos because of preaching the word of God. He was persecuted and put there uh, by Domitian, the emperor, and persecuted. And the Jews were being alienated. But there were other Jews who were received. There were other Jews that were being accepted because as Chad was mentioned, he's talking about Pax Romana. And that means Roman peace. And the law of Roman peace was certain people were allowed to uh, uh, still follow their religion. And the Jews were one of them, but one of those groups. But guess what? The Christians, they were new. Even though they were Jews, they received Christ as Messiah. Guess what? You guys cannot practice your religion. And many of the emperors persecuted uh, of uh, Jewish believers in Messiah as Jesus. So that's what the background is, as Chad mentioned, uh, one door being shut, another door being open, is Jesus saying, hey, the doors might be getting shut on you, and you might be a get, not be able to work because you will not burn incense to uh, this God or that God because you're a messianic believer in Jesus, or you might even be killed by this emperor, but guess what? I open doors that no one can shut, and I shut doors that no one can open. And by the way, Smyrna, the first church that's being persecuted there in Revelation, uh, they were the persecuted church. And he, he says, you know, he, he knew about the suffering that they went through. The word Smyrna, by the way, it's from that word that we get the word myrrh. And myrrh is a plant that smells so beautiful. It was what one of the fragrances that was brought to uh, Jesus after he'd been born uh, by the uh, wise men from the east. And Smyrna, uh, that plant, when it's crushed, is, has a beautiful fragrance. Well, guess what? That church in Smyrna was being crushed. And they were bringing a beautiful fragrance to God who said, you're, you're, you're poor, but you're rich. And they were going to receive the crown of life. And in the midst of all this, uh, God was coming down. The Lord was coming down on those who were saying, hey, we're Jews. They're not really Jews. They're saying the Christians, the Messianic Jews, were not really Jews. They have no stake. They have no. They shouldn't be able to worship freely and so forth. And there was a lot of persecution being stirred up against them. So Jesus is using irony here, saying, hey, these are the Jews who have received their Messiah, Right. Basically, let them know they're the completed Jews. So what you see at this time period is a lot of persecution by the Jews against the Messianic Jews, the completed Jews, and, and against the Gentile believers. In Acts chapter 13, verse 50, we read this, but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution 
against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region, Acts 14, 2 and following. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Uh, there was a plot afoot among both Gentiles and Jews together with them, leaders to mistreat them and stone them, Acts 14, 19. Then some Jews came to Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead, Acts 17, 5. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. So what's important to understand is that Jews who are physical descendants of Abraham are still Jews according to the flesh. Notice they're still being called Jews here, even though they're persecuting the church. But what Jesus is saying is saying, who are they really following at that point? And But is Jesus just writing them off altogether? Or is he writing Israel off altogether? No, God forbid. In fact, uh, he actually addresses this issue. And he calls them his kinsmen according to the flesh in Acts chapter or Romans chapter 9, and then in verses 6 through 8, he says this, But it's not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are Israel, nor are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. So to become a child of God, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, all those who reject Christ, the Messiah, are outside God's kingdom, and they're all children of Satan, ultimately. And all of them must be born again. That's who we all were before we came to Christ. And we want them. God isn't will that one would perish. We want them to come to Christ. So we come to Christ, and then we become children of God. Jesus says, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3 said of the Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, who were persecuting and, and would eventually have him killed, he said, you know, you say you have Abraham as your father, but God is able to raise from these stones children of Abraham. And Jesus said in John chapter 8, verses 40 through 44, actually you can go back to 30-something uh, all the way to 44. He says, you know, you say you have Abraham as your father, but you're doing the works of the devil and you're of your father the devil. So guess what? We have to see whether we're talking physically or spiritually. Spiritually speaking, only those who know Jesus are born of God. It's not a racial thing at all. Red, brown, yellow, black, or white, Jewish, Gentile, Greek, whatever can come to Christ. Those who come to Christ belong to God and are filled with the Spirit of God. Those who belong to the enemy are still under Satan's power, and they need to be born again. So Jesus is using irony there to speak of a true reality, but he also speaks prophetically. Listen to this. Paul makes it clear, Romans 2, 28, 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but is from God. So he's talking now about the spiritual Jew. He's not saying those Jews that aren't born again aren't Jews. They're Jews, but they're Jews according to the flesh. But those who are Jews spiritually are Jews who have become believers. In fact, he calls them the Israel of God. Now, I don't apply that in Galatians chapter 6 to Gentile and Jewish believers. I apply that to Jewish believers are the Israel of God because they're truly to be Israel means governed by God. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. They're governed by God. But we constitute the church, which is made up of Jewish and Gentile believers. But the Apostle Paul warns emphatically in Romans chapter 11 that you Gentiles who've been grafted in as unnatural branches, you've been grafted in among the natural branches. And some of these natural branches, he says, he says some were broken off because of their unbelief, not all of them. But you've been grafted in unnaturally. He says, don't boast against the Jews that were broken off because you stand by your faith. If you don't continue in your faith, you too could be cut off. And he makes it emphatically clear again that these Jews, that we wouldn't have salvation if God hadn't used the Jews to bring the message of salvation to us. He talks about the patriarchs and salvation coming from the Jews. So it's, fact, it's, it's very, very important that we understand the scripture, but that we do understand the scriptures do use some strong language about those who reject Messiah, who were shedding blood along with the Gentiles. And the, the, the persecutions in the book of Acts, as you look at it, starts with, you know, it starts with a, a Jewish persecution and all of a sudden pagan persecution joining together. And then later, as you go through church history, it's heretical persecution. There's like three stages of persecution. Paul writes, though, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 2 through 4, watch out for those dogs. Those evildoers, those mutilators, they were called the mutilation of the flesh because they focused on physical circumcision, not spiritual circumcision of the heart. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. But one thing that's critical for you, Chad, myself, all of us to know, if the Jews who were truly Jews physically, but not spiritually, we were being called by Jesus the synagogue of Satan as they persecuted the Jews who had received the Messiah. 
If he was saying that about them, how much more would he say that about black or black Hebrew Israelites who aren't truly descendants even of Abraham and re reject Jesus Christ as Son of God who saves us through his blood on the cross? How much more would they or how much more would we if we were saying, hey, because, you know, uh, we came from Germany or from England or whatever, we're the true Jews and we're writing off Israel. God has no future for them. They're the false Jews and, and God hates Israel and so forth. How much more would we be in trouble? Not everybody's saying that, but those who would be saying that. I don't call myself a Jew, even though the Bible says, Chad, of you and myself and every other Christian, every other Gentile that's come to Christ, that we're children of Abraham through faith. So we are children of Abraham, but guess what? I'm not a Jew. I'm a child of Abraham through faith, but that doesn't make me physically a Jew because I'm still a physically physically goyim or a Gentile. So we'll close this section by saying this, and I think it's important that you really grasp this. Listen to what Paul says after he talks about not being boastful against the branches, not being conceited, because you too, if you don't continue the faith, he says, can be cut off. He says, there, he says this, and I think it's important, about all Israel being saved. And he's talking about the non-believing Jews that are in Israel right now, many of them will be converted to Christ before Jesus comes back. That's what I'm saying. You have to look at the whole picture. God's not done with the Jews. God still loves Israel. He said they would cease to be a nation only if the sun and the moon and the stars disappeared, which is not going to happen until all Israel is saved. Uh, listen to what this says in verse 25 of Romans chapter 11. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion and he will turn godliness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Who? Israel's. He says, as far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. Did you catch that? He's talking about non-believing Israel. You can't say he's talking about the church here. He says they're your enemies for the, the uh, uh, because of the gospel. But he says, as far as the election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. God loves the non-believing Jews. And, well, but wait, man, they're on Satan's kingdom, you said. Yeah, so are we. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loves Jews. Don't become anti-Semitic. Don't become anti-Jewish. Don't become anti-black, anti-white. Love everybody. Recognize that Jesus died for everybody. Red, brown, yellow, black, or white. Amen. For the gifts and callings of God are unrepentant. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God. Remember, you were disobedient to God. That was us too. And have received mercy as a result of their disobedience. So they too have now become disobedient in order that you too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. Then he says this, for God has bound everyone over to disobedience, Jews and Gentiles, so that he may have mercy upon them all. And I just close with this because we only have a minute left is Joseph was rejected by his brothers. His brothers represented the 12 tribes of Israel because the 12 tribes of Israel came from those brothers, right? Including Joseph. And guess what happens? They reject him. They, they throw him in a pit. They uh, Judah, whose name is really Judas, uh, a tip type or picture of Judas hatches a plan to sell him to the Gentiles. Sound familiar? He was a picture of Jesus. His brothers, as a picture of them rejecting Jesus, he rises, rises to the right hand of power in Egypt. He feeds bread to the world. Does that make sense? Jesus was rejected. He rises to the right hand of the Father and he gives the bread of life to all of us. And guess what? He later revealed himself to his brothers and there was great weeping. In Zechariah chapter 12, it says that the Messiah, I, the, the Yahweh, Yahweh will reveal himself to those who pierced him even as Joseph was pierced, even as Jesus was pierced, Jesus will come back. It says, every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And Zechariah 12 says that they'll mourn for him. And guess what? It says, at that time, they'll see the one whom they pierced, and they'll weep, and they'll repent, and a fountain of cleansing will be opened to them. Thus, all Israel, all those who truly turn to the Messiah, all those Jews who are Jews outwardly right now, who are under Satan's kingdom, will be converted if they turn to Christ. And all those that turn to Christ will make up true Israel, along with the Gentile believers who will not be Israel, but with Israel will go into God's kingdom together as one bride, as one tree made up natural, natural and unnatural branches for God's glory forever and ever. That's God's plan. Make sure you fit into it and that you're born again so you can become a true child of God. Don't make it about race. It's all about grace. Don't make it about skin. It's about sin and needing God's grace to be saved from that sin in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Hey, Joe Schimmel here. We want to thank you for watching. We want to also encourage you not to forget to sign up or subscribe to Good Fight Ministries' YouTube channel. We have the most amazing content. We also have the very popular Good Fight radio show where we examine all kinds of things in light of Scripture, as well as 5.11 News, which is also very eye-opening. And we also have mind-blowing video exposés that you won't see anywhere else. And our 24-7 online radio station, the Good Fight Radio Network, as well as my sermons from Blessed Hope Chapel over on the Blessed Hope Chapel YouTube channel. So thanks again. We'll see you later. And we just pray that the Lord blesses you richly as you seek his face. God bless.